All right, this is out of Psalms 100, 1 through 5. It's just got five verses. But it's a wonderful reminder of thanksgiving and giving thanks. How many here know that we're to give thanks for all things, listen carefully, unto God, which does not say give thanks for everything you go through. It does not say that. It says in everything that is good and perfect, give thanks to God. Now, it also says in everything, give thanks. So we don't thank God for the bad stuff that the enemy tries to give us. We thank God that even though we do go through the valley of the shadow of death, which is the fallen earth, we've taught you, it's the fallen earth, that's Psalms 23. Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Who could finish the rest with me? For you are with me. Amen. So you'll notice that when we study the Old Testament a lot or pull out scripture from the Old Testament, they didn't have the idea of God being in them. They had the idea that God was going to come and he was going to set up his kingdom. He was going to wipe out whoever was in charge and put himself in charge. They had no clue that there would be a time and period called the church age where the church doesn't matter what kind, Jew, Gentile, bond free, male, female, we're all one language, we're all one people in God. God treats us all equally the same. So we are unto him, his children. Can you say amen? And so God wants us to realize there's a different set, now listen carefully, of rules given to his children concerning their walk with God than we read in the Old Testament. The Old Testament demanded that they keep the law, right? And can anybody tell me, let's see how good you guys are. You guys are wonderful. Notice I said you guys. I don't mean to really do not any, anything different to me. Guess what I started off as? A sinner, then I got saved, then I got trained, and then I said to God, God, can I please be an evangelist? And he says, no, I want you to pastor. <laughs> I want you to go through what your mom and dad went through. <laughs> you know, sitting with the pit. No, there's no difference between us. I'm just set in an office called pastor, but I'm your friend. I'm a sheep. I care a lot about you, Linda, and I pray for you. So you're very, very important. So if I ever get to the place where you feel indifferent to me, just walk right up and just slap the tar out of me and says, now get saved, Brother Carey. You know, anyway, so here's our scripture, all right? Make a joyful shout unto the Lord, all you lands. Why? Because Satan thinks his planet is still his. So when you and I pop up and we say, thank you, God, I sure appreciate it. Look what God's doing. Sherry was sharing with me the other day, if you hope you don't mind. She says, so, you know, I don't know enough about the word of God to really tell people about the mysteries and things. I says, Sherry, you have something more than anyone else has. You have your testimony of what God's doing in your life. So if you get to the place where you don't know a whole lot about scripture, you're going to learn. But your testimony we overcome by the blood of the lamb and the word of our testimony and we love not our life until the end. So it talks about our testimony, what God does in our heart, what God is showing us, what God is helping us with. Well, the other day you maybe stubbed your toe and God has healed you up. Can you say amen? These things speak real loud because they're personal. So don't ever get into a place like I did and say, Lord, I don't have much to share. So I wouldn't just bring one Bible to church, I'd bring two. Yeah, I wanted to get you know caught up. I felt like I was behind, I wanted to get caught up. Up. And you know what? God is catching each one of you up. You're not behind his schedule. You're right there in his schedule. So let's read it to you. Make a shout unto the Lord, all ye lands. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before his presence with singing. 
I will enter his heart, you know. Now, know the Lord. He is God. He is he who has made us and not we ourselves. Aren't you go ahead? <laughs> Amen. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. Be thankful to him and bless his name. For the Lord is good and his mercy is everlasting and his truth endures to all generations. Everyone say amen. amen. All right, today we're going to have fun with you. We've got, we're going to simply call this the reach. We've been talking about when we get together, how we can build up the body here, how we can begin to reach up, reach in, and reach out to our communities. Can you say amen? It doesn't matter what age we are, there is something that we can be doing in our REACH program. Now, I'm not talking about just a church REACH program, because the scripture says, as long as there's night and day, as long as there's sowing and reaping, they will be seed time and harvest. Yes. So, we know as a Christian, we live in two realms. Actually, three, but I'm not going to complicate matters. You live in a physical realm where we can talk to one another, we can see one another, we can hear one another, we can sit down to a meal like Thanksgiving, and we can enjoy one another. Can you meet? We live, so we live in a physical realm. We also live in a mental realm where we can understand one another. This is where we get in trouble. <coughs> Excuse me, I sang a little bit. <clears throat> Sometimes we can get people in a place what we call the box. We put people in a box. And do you know why we do that? Most of us don't. Because if we've got somebody analyzed and in a box, then we know who they are. And if we know who they are, then we know we can, what we can do and what we can't do around them. And so we've become God, prejudged them, and fallen into human error. Everyone say, not me. So we do dwell in the physical, we do dwell in a physical realm, in a soul realm, where we learn and we grow. How many know that we have wonderful colleges? But I'm concerned nowadays because they're not teaching much history, not much of our background. In fact, I don't know what they're teaching, but people are coming out of there and they don't really know much about anything society-wise. They are indoctrinated in all kinds of creative things. I'm not going to run to ramp it. So we know that education alone in the realm of the soul is not good enough. How many know you're not smart enough to save yourself? So we live in the physical realm, we live also in the soul realm or intellectual realm, and the third realm we live in is the realm we really are, and that is we're spirit beings, so we live in a spiritual realm. The problem lies in that our spirituality sometimes is not as mature as we think we are. See how I said that? Our spirituality is not as deep or as, as full of wisdom as we think we are. So instead of getting under condemnation, we just grow in the spiritual things of the Lord. Now, who's in charge of growing you up? You are God. Please remember that. I get in the biggest trouble when I take matters in my own hand and I'm just going to straighten Peggy out. You know, I'm going to give her a word from the Lord. Be careful of that stuff. Because now we get into manipulation. And if I think I know more than what you should be doing, than what you actually are doing, then I am meddling and not ministering. Everyone say, thank God I don't have the anointing to meddle. Amen. So let's go into this together. Reach. You see, everyone is a product of what they sow and what they reap. It's absolute principle. As a man sows, so it's share. As a man thinks, so he becomes. So sowing and reaping are very important. So that's why I decided let's teach a little about reaching. Reaching is an action of something you decide to do. Can you say amen? It could be inspired by all kinds. You can reach out and slap someone. 
God forbid, you can reach out and love someone. Depends on the motivation of your heart because you and I are born again. We have God in our heart. So he's our motivation. Can you say amen? So every healthy church must have an upreach to God, an inreach to one another. The Bible says, with one another, we suffer long. <laughs> Hello? And an outreach to those that are lost in our communities. Can you say amen? Where would you be if somebody didn't reach out to you? I remember the first little Baptist group that came up to my house, just finished. Brian will love this and a few others. Those of you on tape, my daughter, plug your ears. My daughter and her husband and a few others down in California, they listen in. So plug your ears. I just finished a bong and sucked down one of those giant beers. You know, says something about English, rot gut, beer, you know. And so I've got quite a little buzz going. I'm just talking street language to you, okay? And this beautiful Baptist couple, whom I had first taught to be Jehovah Witnesses, come up on my, my, my parents' porch with their little daughter, and she's holding a little infant, and they knock on the door, and so what? I, I'm a pastor now. I want to say, if you're going to really want to get saved quickly, rebel against God. Turn into some honorary thing, and you'll come right, and you'll meet him face to face. Otherwise, you'll die. <laughs> so I opened the door like that, and I said, what? And they said, oh, and they stood back. It was like I just scared them. Poor guys. I'm so sorry. When I get to heaven, I'm going to shake their hands and say, thank you for your prayers. And so, uh, you know, big puff of smoke and everything like that. I said, what? And she said, she said, we come to share the good news of the Lord Jesus Christ with you. What were they doing? They were reaching out. And what did I do? Ah! You know what I mean? And, and then they just, I says, the Lord Jesus Christ, yeah, we don't want you to go to hell. And I said, hell? I'm already in hell. This is me com coming out of my mouth. I remember the quote. It was absolutely accurate. I'm already in hell. You know, and I could see him backing down the porch and walking off praying, oh, God, help this man. And look what God did. So never stop reaching out in your prayers for your family members. Amen. The Bible says, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Amen. You keep reminding, one of your children might say something, one grandchildren might, you know, you're about this. Instead of getting it in your head and starting to worry and be anxious over something, you go right to God and says, God, your promise says that my family will become saved if I just faithfully serve you and love you you will go ahead and take care of all the hard work so I'm holding you the Lord to your promise to me Amen. that's all you got to do with God and he says fine faith turns me on kids God says to us faith turns him on you want to turn God on believe for things amen Without faith, it's impossible to what? Please, Please God. So listen here. We also must realize the importance of truth in itself. It's not what we know, but what we practice that opens the kingdom of God's doors to us. Like that, we also, we learn things like where to put our eyes. You know many, many Christians, their eyes are everywhere where, except for where they're supposed to be. Our eyes are supposed to be on Jesus, not on the world. Now, this is a hard one. I ask God, give me something I can give to the people of God. All right. Well, I don't know what that was. But, it, yeah, there's a witness right there. They can give to the people of God that it would challenge them to go to you, God, and help them follow this. And God says, here, God doesn't have to really think to give us something. He is everything. And he simply says, tell them to keep their eyes on me, off the world, off other people, and off themselves. And if they can do that, happy shall they be. <laughs> now, how many know you can't just do that on your own? Come on, let's be honest. 
because the world is not a, it's not a nasty place, it's just crumbling. And if you had, like me, investments in the world, in the stock market, when the first bubble burst, I lost $30,000. Wow. You know, don't go by the investor people. <laughs> Gained it back, but you know, that's a long time ago. So if we look just to the world for giving us wisdom, it will fail, right? Because the world is passing away and Satan's a liar. We, and of course, we know if we put our eyes on other people, sometimes we'll, we'll get a good one and sometimes it won't be so good. Come on, don't look at me in that tone of voice. <laughs> and then if we get our eyes off ourselves, this is what Satan beats us up. There are two kinds of pride. So, and we've learned this, but we'll learn it again. There's the negative pride, poor me. I'm a victim, poor me, you do that. That's just prideful. And God will stand around waiting until you get over yourself. For he resists the proud, gives grace to the humble. But the, we all know the positive part of pride. Aren't I just something? And that the positive part of pride, God resists that. But also, the one Satan uses a lot is depression, being depressed. Because when you're depressed, your eyes are where? On yourself. Yeah, poor me. Poor me. Listen, I'm supposed to say this at this time, so I'm going to say this. God said to say this. You have not committed the sin that God can't forgive you. Or you wouldn't be in church. You wouldn't be sitting right here. Somebody here has been thinking about suicide or something like that. And I'm not, I'm not trying to put it on you. That's just the spirit doing that. And the Lord says your life is worth living. The reason why you feel that pressure that you may be committed in an unpardonable situation is because Satan doesn't want you to become who God has designed you to be, always dwelling on your failures rather than what God says. You notice parents, grandparents, when your little teeny infant spits up and knocks over the coffee machine and does all that, destroys your new rug, do you throw that baby? be out? How much more would God pick you up and say, let's work this out? So we as Christians have got to get out of the judgment business. We've got to get out of the situations in the conversational business where we become critical. We've learned that. Eyes off ourselves, eyes on the Lord, right? We also found out that we're hidden in Christ, in God. So you and I, when we get born again, we became victorious at the moment we said, Jesus, I surrender, come into my heart. You were placed into victory. You were placed out of sin into love. And God says, I'm with you. I will never leave you nor forsake you. Now, what happens is our head gets filled up with all these lies. That's why we don't walk by our head. That's called head knowledge. We walk by heart knowledge. 15 inches from your head to your heart and literally a complete disaster. Because if you try to th figure things out and try to wonder why and do all that kind of stuff, you'll just wander around and you'll always feel unworthy. That's exactly what Satan wants because your eyes are not on God. Your eyes are on yourself. So we want to get out of our understanding everything and just be like a child again and say, Lord, I take it by faith and I'm just going to enjoy our venture with you through this day. Someone say amen. amen. That's who you are. You're a champion. You didn't make yourself that way. Guess what? So you don't have to defend it. You just get up and watch your testimony. If you're a mom and your kids are seen the way you used to be as a mom and it wasn't very good, they see mom is changing, that testimony will speak more things than whatever you can tell or say to them. My dad, when he first saw that I had really changed, you know what he said to me? He says, at least now, Carrie, I can believe what you're telling me. <laughs> That's all he could respond to. But he saw change in my life. God wants to bring change in our lives so the people around us can see that God is active. He's aware. He's moving for it is God that works in you. Not here. Here. To do his good will and his pleasure. 
You are his goodwill and his pleasure. Did you know that? Look at your neighbor and says, I am his goodwill and pleasure. Not you, I am. <laughs> see, you see, that's what, that's what the enemy does. He tries to get us comparing and doing all that. No, you're the only one like you. And God enjoys its relationship with you. Now, would you relax and enjoy your relationship with him? See, oh me. All right. Listen, everything God does is set up on a sowing and reaping principle. Giving receiving, hearing the word and giving out the word of God, receiving a blessing and being a blessing. So we receive the word and now we must become a doer of the word. Can you say amen? amen. But we have to be balanced. Young Christians, they'll get saved and because they want to do something. They'll go out and do something that's beyond their capability and fail at it. And then the enemy, we are up there sitting on them, saying, ah, see, there you go. People are going to call you a hypocrite. Listen, a hypocrite is somebody that tells everybody else what to do, but does it not themselves. That's what a hypocrite is. A person that has faults is not a hypocrite. They're a person that's come to the hospital to get our healing, to get our stuff fixed. Can we say amen? That's why we don't look at the faults and the moats and all the other struggles that people are going through, but rather we are, are through patience, wait with them for the victories to come. Instead of saying, well, I can tell you why you, you're failing at what you're doing. I mean, who wants to come to church and meet somebody like that at the door? Hi, I'm your greeter today, and I can tell you what you've been doing wrong. <laughs> and I'm sure many of you have met someone like that. Oh, stay away from so-and-so. She'll let you know what you're doing wrong. <laughs> Are you with me? All right. So let's talk about upreach. Now, each one of these, I won't be able to go into real depth. But every one of these reaches are the, a part of the sowing and reaping principle. You might be of age. What can I do? Well, can you send out birthday cards to people that need to be told they're loved and cared for? You may be up in age. What can you do? Can you take out the prayer book and pray for everybody in your churches? A small church like this, you can list everybody in the church and take just 20 minutes a day and pray for all that you normally pray for and just add a couple of minutes for everybody in the church. You realize what that would do? It would spark a revival. So what happens? We forget about doing things like that. So upreach is very important because who are we reaching to? God. Amen. Now, when we were in school and you had the answer and the teacher, how did the teacher know you had the answer? Ooh, 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 ooh. Christians, when you come to church, ooh, 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 ooh. get your hands in the air. You got the answer? Shows part of the covenant too, remember? Jesus cut the covenant and he was, he was pierced in his wrists above his hands right so but whatever Jesus would show his hands it's symbol of a covenant well Christians we don't have a scar in our hands but we have Jesus in them and every time you lift your hands you're lifting up Jesus and Jesus said if I be lifted up I will draw all men nigh unto me be a lifter of Jesus <clears throat> are you with him not only that but Little teeny children, when they want mom and dad to pick them up, what do they do? <laughs> right? It's on camera, please. <laughs> upreach is so important because if you don't have a good, strong upreach with God, everything after that will be tremendously flawed or picked on. You see, we go to God so his anointing will get on everything that he's asked us to do. So it's no longer us doing it, but it's God in us doing the work. So if God is motivating us and propelling us to do the work, Satan can't attack it. Why? Because it's not you doing it, but God in you doing it. So whenever he asks you to do something, if God, you know it's God, and he asks you to do something, you don't even have to be concerned how it's going to be done. You just go to him and say, Lord, I need you to line it out for me because you know how I am. 
and go start lining it all up for you. And you'll be hearing things like, be not troubled. <laughs> I've got this. How many's ever heard something like that from God? Don't worry about it. I got this. Amen. Boy, I love that feeling. When I go to God and I pray and I say, Lord, this is in your hands. This is beyond me. And God says, I got this, son. Now you rest with me. Hello. Hey, and if I need you, I'll just tell you what I need. You know, I kind of feel like Abraham. How many remember the story of Abraham? God said to Abraham, Abraham, I'm going to make you a father of many nations. I'm going to cut a covenant with you. Your offspring or your children are going to be like the sand of the sea and the stars of the sky. Most people go, wow, that's a lot. Now, where, are, where is sand? Is it on the earth or in the sky? So sand of the earth, your offspring sand of the earth is natural juice. The natural Jews are going to affect the world. And it says, and then the stars of the heaven. Stars of the heaven. That means your phone's on. Stars of the heaven is like this. Those are the born again, spiritual children of God. Because Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness and offered his son, his only begotten son, gave God permission to offer his only begotten son. And Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness. So because of our heavenly father of promise, Abraham, before he became Jewish, which is 25 years later, he was a Gentile believing God, a symbol of you and I, what God would do in our life changes from who we are or who we were into what God wants us to be. Someone look at your neighbor and say, yes, amen. Now you might say, well, that's a huge responsibility. Yes, and you cannot do it on your own. So every day you get up and you surrender, say, God, I literally surrender. I still have d desires for wrong things and I, I still think bad thoughts and God says yeah so so does everybody else now let me help you that was for somebody to pay real close attention to you're not letting God help you you're trying to figure it out so you can work with God and God says listen you're wearing yourself out if that talks to your heart listen carefully and ask God more wisdom for it because I know somebody that's really got a word to the wise there. All right, let's go on. Upreach. So go with me to 2 Corinthians 3.18. You all know the scripture. This talks about our focus. Now, do you, do you know the history of the first, first Corinthians? You know the history of the Corinthian church? They were the hippie church. The Colossian church was the intellectual church okay I'm, I'm just giving you some history so you understand so they looked a lot of the stuff intellectually you know it's really hard to get an intellectual person say because they think they know it all I'm just saying what the Bible says okay and then the Corinthian church was the hippie church anything goes if you read the accounts they were doing all kinds of crazy things they were feeding their face on the communion dishes and they were running down and bragging over the fact that they went down to the, the temple and got their meat from a prostitute and now it's carving it up and giving it out and, and they had just no idea what it meant to really live for God so Paul had to write some real strong but clear messages he says now if you're going to focus on anything and be successful at anything 2 Corinthians 3.18 is yours everyone say it's mine if you're like Piggy you already read it 2 Corinthians 3.18 says but we all everyone say we all look at your neighbor and say that you that's you okay but we all with an open or unveiled face are beholding as in a mirror the glory of God. We're focusing on Jesus. Do you see him clearly? Do you still see him a little foggy? Don't worry. Just focus in on him. The Holy Spirit knows when you're seeking God. He opens the door and says, come on in. 
when you're not seeking God, you're going to church, your mind's somewhere else, just where the enemy wants it to be, then the door seems closed and it seems like you don't get what you need. All you got to do is say, Lord, I come into your house and I surrender. Talk to me. When you do that, you will never leave a church without it ministering something. Because sometimes it's not what they say, it's what they don't say can actually speak loud to you. You know, if they're a bunch of goof offs, it's what they don't do can teach you. Hello. All right, so drop down to Colossians chapter one. <coughs> In the upreach of our life, God must be first. Everyone say, God must be first. Colossians 1, 15 through 18. And it's talking about Jesus, and it says, He, Jesus, is the image of the invisible God. He that has seen me, Philip, has seen the Father, and the firstborn over all creation. For by him, Jesus, all things were created that are in heaven, that are on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created through, look at the term, through him and for him. So does God the Father really want us to pay attention to Jesus? Where does he want us to put Jesus? First in everything we do. For example, if you catch yourself worrying, you're not putting Jesus first. Why? If you had the people that I'm around, you'd worry too. No, all things through prayer and supplication gets rid of anxiety. Be anxious for nothing, but in all things through prayer, with thanksgiving, make your requests known unto God. This is a crazy time, God, I need help. And God says, I'm right here. As soon as you ask, he's right there. He's never stopped being right there. The problem is now you're aware of him. You see, sometimes we need to say something or hear something. A little preaching, a little singing causes us to be more aware of God and less aware of our surrounding circumstances. Someone say amen. So he's the image of the invisible God, the firstborn for all creation. For by him all things are created that are in heaven, in earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or powers or, or principalities. All these were created through him and for him. And he is before all things. You get up in the morning, first thing before you start going after what you need, talk to God on the way. You got to go to the restroom, you get up, talk to God on the way. So the Lord, get me there safely. If you you got to remember, like if you're me, I stick your foot on. Put your foot on before you take a step there. <laughs> so the first couple of weeks, I've been hearing God, you know, put your foot on. I, that was a long time ago, okay? Let's go on. He is before all things, and in him all things are held together, consist. Say the word consist. We took God out of the schools and look. People are taking God out of things and look. Everything that God's been removed falls apart. So guess what? You want more of God and less of yourself. Why? Because every time we push God away, we crumble. It wasn't this situation that got you, it wasn't that situation. It was the fact that you put God on the second burner of your life that opened the door so Satan could crawl right on through and give you a good whipping. Hello? If it's raining outside and you have an umbrella, for heaven's sakes, use it! Don't stay there and say, man, it's raining. Well, you know, it rains on the just and the unjust. No. Stop being a dum dum. We're always, every one of us, as smart as you are, you're a dum dum. And when we do it on our own, it's a dum dum thing. And how about you? I got a sack of dum dums in my office. They're little suckers. So we'll pass a few of those out if you ever need any. 
Amen. I've done a lot of things I thought I was helping God with. That's what's fun. God doesn't condemn us. One time he said to me, he says, Carrie, are you done? No, I'm not done. Don't you understand what I'm going through? I'm just as well as I'm going to tell you. And then he says, are you done yet? And I finally realized what he was trying to get through to me. He already understood all that. Why am I telling him how things are when he knows everything? Just think about it. See, that's what our head does. Our head wants to just take over everything and figure it out. That way, when things come together, we feel a little good about it. Because our little hands helped. Now, I'm just kind of teasing us. But that's how the enemy works. Have you felt the enemy back off of you and giving you a little space? That's the time you need to be the most alert. Because usually when he backs on off of you, he, you've hit him really hard, so he's regrouping. Okay? And if he regroups, don't believe for his next attack is going to be devastating. Don't believe for a next attack, but don't be silly to believe it wouldn't happen either. It's the counterattacks that usually get us. It's not the initial beating on the devil and taking authority over things, releasing God on him. It's us kicking back on our ease and thinking we're going to re... Now listen, this one's hard to talk about. Then we kind of pamper ourselves and eat the extra piece of cake. Because we got the victory now and we won it. So we kind of pamper ourselves. Now, there's nothing wrong with that. It, but if you don't have your armor on, don't run around in your own birthday party and it's not your birthday. So if we think a little higher than we ought to think, we kind of set ourselves up. So me teaching and sharing that is not picking on you. I'm just saying that when you get victories and you'll get them every day, God will see to it. Don't kick back and realize, oh, yeah, this is just, oh, God's just really blessing me. Don't kick back and do that. Sit down and say, now teach me more, Lord. Instead of kicking back on what you want or think you want, you're kick, kicking back in a, in a position of asking God to teach you more. Teach you more. How many here have arrived? You don't need to learn anything more. Oh, I used to have people come to church here a long time ago. They knew everything. All they knew how to do is get in trouble and create division. Isn't that funny? God says to mark them and don't keep any company with people that cause divisions. All right, let's move on. So Colossians says, now listen, and he is the head of the body of Christ. That means he's our head. So please use your head in the decisions you make. And that is the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from among the dead, and in all things that Jesus may be honored and given preeminence. You see, today, folks, we get a special visitor. The Lord Jesus Christ and his entourage are going to be coming in here. What do you think we would do? Immediately, we start adjusting chairs, getting things out, getting a, you know, we would show preeminence. The king is coming to visit. When you get up in the morning, folks, and you show God preeminence, you address him before you address anything else. God, good morning. Or you could go, God, what a morning. <laughs> so we address God in preeminence. Oh, Lord, I respect you. I love you. Lord, you are the first in my life. And Lord, if I'm ever falling short in that, please remind me and help me to, to make up for that. But Lord, I thank you that you love me with an everlasting life. Just tell him about what he, what he says in his word. Man, you'll get so dosed and so blessed with the Holy Spirit, you might even forget what time it is and might be late for work. God forbid. And the rest of us, the rest of us retirees, we'll just buzz on. Can you say amen? A couple little points I want you to get. Number one, upreach is really placing our Heavenly Father first in all things. We do this through Christ with our spirit man. Two, we come through Christ before our Father daily, not when you need it. 
Meet with him first daily. Guaranteed you're going to have to make yourself do that. But when you do that, the rewards are beyond your words. Because he rewards those that, what, diligently seek him. Thirdly, we develop a life of worship and stability by meeting with God, by developing that upreach. Hello. And in leadership, you should see God alive and well in my heart, in, in my wife's heart, because we spend time putting God first. That's the only reason we're stable. These are crazy, crazy times. And you'll find out maybe you know a Christian friend or something that seems like their whole life's falling apart. They need to go where they could be taught and shown what to do so God could bring stability into their life. I don't know about you, but I had a pastor one time, a wonderful man, but he just didn't understand. He says, you know, I've always learned through my life, and I'm waiting for some real heavy revy. He says, I'm always either going through a trial, I'm in a trial, or one's coming. I looked at him, I said, how about you just got through a blessing, you believe him for another blessing, and you know another blessing's coming. Why are you focusing on the trouble? We focus on the trouble because we've been exercised to do that very thing. To be negative, to focus on what's wrong. Oh, we're going to go on a vacation. And you can think of eight things you got to do to make sure everything works. I remember my first vacation after four years of ministry. I actually got to build a campfire and sit down. And you know the one thing I found myself I couldn't do was sit still. Because I was boogieing working to do something even on my vacation. Learn to rest in him. Learn to listen. Some of the greatest things God could ever tell you come when you're quiet and you're at rest. You could even be sitting on the toilet. Doesn't matter. Where you're restful and you're, you're open and God can speak to you. Can you say amen? And he doesn't have to bypass your mind. That's like YouTube on steroids. <laughs> amen. <clears throat> Facebook gone awry. You know, get your face out of that book and put your face in this book. Amen. All right, so, let, amen. So we come through Christ before our Father by actions, by meeting with him, praising him, worshiping, seeking his word. We develop a life of worship and thanksgiving, and we learn to forget our past. I've told everybody, and I always tell everybody, I don't care where you've been. That doesn't dictate who you are. What dictates who you are is who you walk with, God, and what decisions you make. But your past, I don't want you to have to tell me. I have a horrible past too. And what good does it do for me to tell you all the horrible things I did? Better yet, I want to meet with God and I want God to open up my eyes to what he has for me. Amen. And he's encouraged me through Paul to forget those things which are behind. Let go of those things and focus on the high call of the mark of Christ. Amen. Amen. Get your eyes back on the finish line. His name is Jesus. Yes. So upreach is important. That means God becomes first in what you do and say. That means his word becomes important because in the beginning was the word, the word was with God, and the word was God. Your worship in church and church attendance are utmost important. The way God has set it up is you got to get out of yourself, get in your car, and come to church. And you have to come expecting and wanting to learn, leaving all your laundry at home. Please, church is not a place for you to share all your problems. We're not Jesus. Your prayer time with God, that's when you do that. 
Church is a time to learn, to grow, to develop, to get involved. Get involved in a reach program. Now we found out that God, we reach out to God so we could be healthy in everything else we do. So we got upreach. I think you got it. Now we have inreach. Now here's what the church has failed. Instead of loving one another like God loves us, we get to analyzing one another. Get to saying, hey, they're always late for church. I better talk to them about that. No, that's not your job. It's not my job either. My job is to give you the word, to pray for you, to build you up, not to pick on your faults, nor give you the third degree of drilling. Let's all go to the dentist. Come up forward now. We're going to worship. <laughs> Some churches, it's either you don't get anything or you get a program or you get drilled on. No, we want you to get the word of God so that in, throughout your week, you can live it. You can see God working with you. And when somebody says, hey, wow, you, you just look different. What's going on? You can tell them what God's doing in your life. Just talk about God. God will see to it, they hear. Amen. All right, so let's talk about in reach. Go with me, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, please. Verse 26 through 31. In reach. That's reaching out to one another in the church. Can you say amen? So if you're a foot, don't become an athletic foot. But the foot can't say to the hand, I have no need of you. Nor can the hand say to the eye, I have no need of you. God has put all of us together within a body so each one of us would complement one another, build one another up, and be a testimony. Can you say amen? Didn't Jesus say, if your eye offend thee, what? Pluck it out, and if your hand offend thee, cut it off. Now, he's not talking about, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say this. It literally includes real eyes and real arms. But here's what God is saying. What do you do with your eyes? You see, you look at things. So if you're looking at all of the negative things of people and the government and all that kind of stuff, rather than you pluck it out than have it influence you in a negative way. That's what he's saying. God doesn't really want to dig your eye out of your eye socket. Run around and show Marvin. Here, Marvin, look at this. <laughs> Nor cut off your arm. What does your arm do? Your arm does work. So you can't say to an arm, I don't need your work. And you can't say to the eye, I don't need what you see. No, our taste here, you see what I'm saying? It's not for us to figure out how God puts the body together. Did you know Psalms 133 says, except the Lord build the church, those that labor, labor in vain. So the whole thing that Linda and I do here is we present ourselves before God. He tells us what to do, how to pray for you guys. Here I'm using the term you guys. How to pray for, for us all and lift one another up. In so doing, we're loving you and we're doing our job. Your job is to come to church on a regular basis with an open, childlike manner. Don't come with a know-it-all attitude and sit under and let the word pour over you and give you ideas and help you and strengthen you because the word is God. And if you don't hear the word, the Holy Spirit will say, oh, well, I guess they're just happy with the disaster of their life. I'll sit around until they're willing to listen again. Because the Spirit, God, doesn't leave us. He just sits around kind of in the corner waiting for us to get over ourselves. Poke, poke your neighbor, could be your husband, wife, and say, see? <laughs> see? All right, let's move on. All right, so in verse 26, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, For you see your calling, brethren, not many wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. 
For God has chosen the foolish things of this world to put to shame the things that are wise. And God has chosen the weak things of this world to put to shame the things which are mighty. And the base things are the lowly things of this world. So the things which are despised, God has chosen. That's you and I, a wretch like me. Hello. And the things which are not, you don't see anything, to bring to nothing the things that are. That no flesh shall glory in his presence, but of him you are in Christ Jesus, who became for us wisdom from God, and righteousness, and sanctification being set apart for us, and redemption, that as it is written, he who glories, let him glory in who? Amen. Get up in the morning, first addressed, you go to God. God, I glory in you. You got me with none brushed teeth, none brushed hair, no makeup on. How do you like them biscuits? Lord, you got me. And God just love you. He just wrap his arm around because he wants to hear from you. I, I, can, I can almost see God scratching his head and saying to Adam and Eve in the beginning, have you eaten of the tree I told you not to eat of? Yeah, I now in the bushes. You got fig leaves tied around with you. And not only that, but your zipper's open. <laughs> I can just imagine God saying, what happened to our fellowship? What happened to our lovely time together every day? And let me say this to you, brother and sister. What has happened to your time with God every day? Have you let him know that he's first? Did you love him dearly? If not, tell him till you're tired of telling him. Let him know that he's first. Let your heart just come out of you. You're going to weep, weep. Let him know how important he is in your life. Man, every time I did that to my dad, I didn't ask him for a thing. I'm talking about my physical dad. Because normally I'd come to him and he'd say, what do you want? Our Heavenly Father doesn't ever do that. Ever, ever do that. He knows you have need. He has plenty. We come, I went to my dad and I says, Dad, I, I, I just want to tell you I love you. He says, you need the keys of the car? What is it you need? Did you mess up with your mom? You know, you didn't sass your mom, did you? My dad's immediately trying to think physical, you know. I says, no, Dad, I just want to tell you, you're doing a good job and you're a good father. Thank you. Now, I could have died and gone to heaven. He was my buddy all week long. Now, you take that, of course, that's a physical plane. And if, if I happen to be a very, very blessed man with, I had good, fairly good parents. They loved God. You know, I led them to Jesus and everything. But, but they had a good sense of what was right and wrong. I can say that about my parents. And, and my dad, you know, just would just bundle up. How much more would our Heavenly Father? If you let him know every morning how wonderful he is, how special he is, and as far as you're concerned, that there is no other. If you let him do that and you take a little time in doing that, I guarantee the windows of heaven will open right up. You won't be able to write down fast enough some of the ideas and some of the neat things God reveals to you. Why? Because he's waiting. He says, I've been waiting and looking to and fro, God says looking for anyone that would listen and want to talk and be with me. And look, we got a church. Let me tell this. This is something that really, really, Billy Graham is gone. Who's going to replace him? Billy Sunday is gone. Oral Roberts is gone. Kenneth Hagin is gone. All these generals, all these mighty leaders that oftentimes we looked up to, they're gone. What are you going to do? Are you going to sit there and think of yourself? Are you going to rise up and let God make you the champion and become a leader like you're supposed to? Do I have any volunteers? Put your hand in the air if that's you. Remember, God makes you into that. You don't make yourself. Amen. So we need in reach to one another to build one another up. Amen. And in this church, nobody here is pretentious. We're not put-ons. 
You got what you got. And I'm so glad we do. We have you and you have us. Amen. So in reach is just making sure you build people up. Somebody has a need, take a little time out to pray for them. Say amen. amen. Things like the lady's tea or a gift exchange for Christmas. These are all in a men's ministry breakfast. Things that minister to the body. Maybe a, a spring fair or concert. These are, these are in reaches where we reach to each other in this area. Good, healthy church has great upreach, good in reach. And then the last one is outreach, isn't it? Now, how many know that reaching out to people is not as hard as it seems? Hello. Every place I go, I seem to leave a witness, a testimony. A God bless you. Hey, do you know God? When I was in the hospital, they couldn't wait to get rid of me. <laughs> Would you take him in this room? He's really wearing our nurses out, man, in here. Outreach. It's unlimited. I love the fact when Christmas time, let's go walk around and sing Christmas carols around this little neighborhood. Outreaches during certain seasons that the world embrace, we can reach out and win souls with. Outreach is going out and feeding the hungry. We have a mission group that we send to. We send to uh, several people that dig wells for people who can't find water, like in Africa and South America. You know, you get behind and you invest in part of that well with a lot of other people, and the well gets dug in a bunch of people's honor of loving God, it gets dug in the, the village, becomes healthy. Can you say amen? And you know what? There's plenty of outreaches. Love to see somebody take on our missions, organize it all up, and where we send our small gifts, and how we can reach out. So if you're up in age and you say, well, I can't get out and witness, no, but you can do a lot of other things that get out and witness. Can you say amen? Having a, a, we couldn't do it this year, but we, had, we have a Halloween thing. We could have a carnival. There's all kinds of stuff that we need to do. And I was talking, you know, with a brother the other day, and I says, the only thing that we lack is people. We, we have all the stuff for plays and for TV programs and all these. It's as if God says, you build it. I'll send the people. And now they're starting to come. Wonderful. So you might be here and, and thinking about upreach. You got that down and in reach. You care for one another. You finally found a church that cares for you. And we're kind of working together. And then outreach. Now listen, the thing I would love for you to do, if God has placed it on your heart to do things like that, write it down. What is God directing you? And how does he direct? Go ahead and write those things down. Linda and I will sit down with you and help you get focused in the right area. If it's giving out food, if it's witnessing during Christmas, it's caroling, it doesn't really matter. We have nothing locked in here. It has to be done this way and it can't be done that way. No, I want you to do what God tells you to do. And Linda and I are doing our best, our best to see that we can get to you what you have need of as a church goes. And God will do the rest. You're going to get out, you know, be reassured, be encouraged from me. The only thing is, if it really sounds pretty wacky, we might have to sit down with you. What do you mean you want to take a banner and leap out of an airplane over Puyallup? Well, let's sit down and talk about that a little. <laughs> you know what I mean. So, we need a healthy upreach. Folks, to have a healthy upreach, who do you meet with? What do you attend? What do you read? 
And what do you let him know he is first? Second is reaching out to people. Never look at somebody as if they lost their dog. Always look at them as, I'm glad to see you. I appreciate you being here. It's not a put on, it's the truth. We have been only a few members for so long. When we see a new face, we're gonna have a parade. Hello, and so reaching out to one another, amen. You got something on your heart, ask for prayer. I've been outreach, I'm excited because we're gonna put a new floor in our, in our children's area or where our food deal is and get all that straightened up. I'm just praying God bring us people who see the vision and want to accomplish the thing. So how many reaches do we need to be a healthy church? Three, up, in, and outreach. Now I left it open for your interpretation to go meet with God and what he would have you to do. Look out among you and find yourself men and women that are in God that don't mind serving and get some help. Don't try to do everything yourself. Well, if you got something out of that this morning, would you give the Lord praise? Yeah!